Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we are going to talk about three different libraries to remove unused CSS. Before that, just a quick thanks. This channel has now 100 subscribers and you know, it just made me happy to know that you don't mind watching a socially awkward developers uh, with a really French accent. Um, so thank you. Let's talk about those libraries. The reason why I thought it was a good idea to talk about these topics is because of the survey called State of CSS 2020. And in this survey, it was mentioned um, some tools. And the main tools that was mentioned in the survey, as uh, a question was, which utilities or tools do you use regularly? Stylint, which is a linter, was um, in the question, and two other tools. Among those tools, Purge CSS and Purify CSS, they are tools to remove unused CSS. I happen to be uh, a contributor of Purify CSS and I'm, well, the author of Purge CSS. So it's, it seems like a good idea to talk about it. So like a lot of videos, I wrote an article um, about that and the link is in the description. So before I, I dive into the three different libraries that are the most popular to remove unused CSS today, let's talk about why you would want to use that kind of library in the first place. So the first reason why you would want to use really this type of libraries in the first place is when you are using a CSS framework. One CSS framework that is using Perch CSS a lot is Tailwind CSS and Perch CSS is actually included in Tailwind CSS. So it doesn't matter how much of the framework you're using. I don't know if you are like me. I remember Bootstrap back in the day uh, when I tried to use it like for the first times. I didn't exactly like the experience because every single time I would use it, my website, which would be extremely simple because I was just getting started, it would be a simple page, but it would take a lot of time to load because I would need to install all of those, all of those useless file really. I would just use a really small set of the framework. And I remember looking in, into the website of Bootstrap and there was an option to create your own version of Bootstrap by unselecting features of it. The only problem is that it's not a really great developer experience because what happened is if I, let's just say, unselect a lot of features and then I just decide, oh, well, you know what? I'm just going to use it. I need to go back to the website. I need to download a new version again. For development, that, that just not, that just not good. So it's definitely one of the reasons you might want to use a library to remove a new CSS because it just provides you out of the box this experience where you don't have to do anything. You just use the full version of the framework. You have access to every classes. You have access to everything. And when you are building to production, it will just remove what is not used. So I would say that the first main reason why you would want to use it so the second use case that I would talk about is legacy website. Sometimes you just have a website that just got out of hand and, you know, CSS has been added over time. And while you have added some, you didn't remove uh, the unused one and you end up with a massive CSS file and you just have to clean it up. While you can spend developer resources on, on this task, just say, hey, I want to take one week to clean up the CSS and remove all this unused CSS manually, you can also benefit from those libraries and just do it right away. I would still advise to, you know, clean up your CSS if it's messy, but at least your user will just see the result right away, which is less code going to your website. So less code shipped, it might speed up your loading time. And talking about loading time, I think another use case that is really practical is critical pages. So what I mean by critical pages is pages like the payments page and the sign up flow. Those pages are critical because you want them to be as fast as possible. Literally being slow means less revenue. So you have like a direct correlation between how fast your website loads and the amount of con conversion that you get. And so you might want to ship less code on those websites in particular. So that would be the third, um, the third reason to use those libraries. 
So now let's dive deep into the comparison and it's just going to be a quick overview. Um, I'll probably talk a bit more about purchase as in other videos. Purchase CSS is looking at two different things, the content of your website and is CSS. When I say content, I mean the HTML file, it could be PHP, it could be JavaScript. Purchase CSS has a concept of extractor functions. An extractor function is just a function that will take the content of a file and try to output the potential selectors from it. So what I mean by that is in this file, you see doc type HTML, HTML lang, it's a, it's a typical HTML file. And we want to be able to figure out which of those selectors are used. So what purchases is doing is extremely simple, taking a function with the strings that contain everything here and try to output the potential selectors. And the result of this function will basically be some kind of array of selectors or text depending on what that function is. And the difference between CSS and CSS is this extractor function. CSS has a default one that is not configurable and it is kind of a problem because it doesn't work all the time. For example, the reason why Tailwind CSS doesn't use CSS is because they can't configure it to work with escaped characters. You might have seen Tailwind CSS using like colon in their name and also, you know, slash and basically special characters. And so if you can't configure this function to understand those, then it's just not going to work. But so by default, CSS is essentially taking every word of the document as a potential selectors. And then it will look at the CSS file, go through each of the selectors and figure out which one is not present. If I look at this file, I see text transparent. And you might see in this array, text transparent is just not there. So text transparent will be removed from the output. One thing that I want to talk about about this is the default extractor. So by default, it will just, like I said, pretty much take every word. One thing that you can do is create a, an extractor that will uh, be more precise. So in this one, you see that doc type and HTML has been taken into consideration. If I have some kind of classes that are named doc type, it's going to be kept, but it's not, it's not a class name, right? I didn't use it as a class name here. You can kind of guess that it's, it doesn't have to be kept. And you can use a custom, I would say, extractor spe specially for your file. So here's an example of purchases from HTML. Um, I actually changed it last week to work really well with that type of file. And you can specify attributes, name, value, classes, IDs, tag, to really make the distinction between what is an ID, what is a class name. And what's happening is, if you're using this version of purchases from HTML, then let's just say you have this type of content. It's just a test. Test will not be considered a class name because it is in the content, but it is not in the class. So being able to have a function to make that distinction is really useful for that. We talked about CSS and purify CSS, and there is another one. And the other one is unCSS. Instead of analyzing the file, it attempts to run your HTML file on your website and look for selectors that it found in your CSS. You can see it a bit like the Chrome DevTools. Imagine you are running your website and in the Chrome DevTools, you just manually one by one in your CSS selector type document.query selector. And if you find null, you, you know that it's not used. The main problem with this approach is that sometimes you don't exactly have elements on your website right away. Let's imagine you build a website with React and you create a model. The model doesn't exist in the DOM, but the style exists in your CSS for it. But with uncSS, it's just going to say, hey, document.query selector, 
that model, for example, well, I can't see it, so it must not be used. But you know that if you click on the button, React is going to create this model. Another point that doesn't make it really practical is the fact that it's trying to run your website. And if you have PHP files, if you have, uh, let's just say, Pug file, uh, Twig file, Blade, anything else than HTML, you can't exactly run your website um, straight away. There is a build process that needs to happen or you need to um, run your server locally, then run NCSS on it, and it's not super practical. And the fact that it's trying to run your website it's just making the build process really slow. You can imagine that looking at files like statically is a little bit different than trying to run a website and you know go through the selectors. So my recommendation would be to use Perch CSS among the three. Obviously, I'm the author of Perch CSS, so you might think that it's not really an objective, you know, point of view. But you can see for yourself. I really think that Perch CSS was meant to be an improved version of Purify CSS, and the fact that it's now the most used tool to do this task kind of proved that it succeeded in in that regard. And CSS. Uh, is really good and I like the approach but it takes a long time to build because it's trying essentially to run your entire website also it will not work perfectly if you have uh, let's just say a PHP website and you're trying to do it with your PHP file you need to basically maintain this idea of clicking on a button to make your model appear that's the kind of thing that you need to consider if you're using NCSS which might be unpractical for some. Okay, I feel like I talk for a long time, so I'm gonna stop there. If you are interested in that type of content, do not hesitate to subscribe. You can like the video if you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.